So, Father, again, we thank you for uh, this day and opportunity we have to gather with you on this Father's Day. And we thank you for being our caring and loving Father who's definitely worth respecting and valuing and knowing the love you care and guide to each one of us as your children, your sons and your daughters, your children, your servants. We ask you to continue to guide and direct us in understanding the, the truth and the, and the encouragement and the, the buffeting that you give to us in Proverbs 5, um, particularly unto men and the fate in which you have this timing to be with us is the lesson from which we would be teaching today. So we ask, Father, to be with each and every father uh, that has had and has children uh, throughout the ministry, Father. We thank for uh, Greg and Todd and Dave. And we just uh, continue to ask that you lift them up and Al. And uh, just thank you for all that you have worked and done in their lives, continue to instill a sense of uh, courage and faith and love and peace that you are in and through them, uh, guiding, directing with wisdom and with insight to be and do what you want them to be and do. So we ask, Father, now that you continue to guide us and direct us as our counselor, our teacher, our guide, our, our pastor, our shepherd, and teach us these things in truth that you want us to glean and know, know and understand from this proverb, this letter of wisdom that you imparted by the Holy Spirit through the hand of Solomon. Uh, one would speak of such insight and knowing these things of being chaste and being disciplined in mind and wouldn't give us insight to all the wisdom you've given as a man, as a sinner. We thank you for using him to give us this insight. So, Father, we thank you as this, this time is dedicated to you. Be our guide and our, our teacher again, and let us everything be said in glory to your name. And we thank you for all you continue to do and have done in our lives. In Jesus, Yeshua's name, we pray these things. Amen. All right, so we have Greg and Sandy, correct, babe? Yes. All right, if others join us, let me know. <coughs> So uh, today's lesson is going to be on Proverbs 5. And to, for, to help you understand why it is that we're doing this is because I had a person at work say to me, no one's ever preached on Proverbs 5. And he's a 60-plus-year-old man and been in church all his life, he said, Methodist upbringing, albeit. Um, but he said that's the way it's always been, and he's never heard it, and he's always asked preachers to preach on it, and they have preached on it. Why I said, that's all because, he, because you'll, the content is about a man living the way he's supposed to. And so he just believes that that's the one thing that takes down all men, so why wouldn't people talk about it? And I said, I don't know what to tell you other than the fact that uh, he goes, well, you, you teach on it, you taught on it? I said, no. He goes, well, you see? And I go, listen, I'm going to teach on it, so you can't say that no more, all right? So once I do, I'll share all the notes with you, and you can't say anymore, and no one's ever taught on it. How about that? <laughs> so so uh, anyway, I said, it's going to be more than you bargained for, I tell you that right now, because you may think it says one thing, but it's going to say something else entirely and much more depth to it than what you probably realize. So as we go through today's lesson, we'll be on Proverbs 5. And again, as you heard in my prayer, what's interesting enough is to say that, uh, is there somebody online, babe? Tracy and Vicki. Hello, Tracy and Vicki. Uh, thanks for joining us. And, and so we're in Proverbs 5, and one of the things you'll, you'll continue to, to look at is, as we go through this, it's, it's ironic, as I mentioned in the prayer, that the timing of this, I was mentioning to Nancy earlier, I, I, didn't, I didn't slot this out this way. It, I, we're doing Theophanies and Christophanies. We happen to finish, and now all of a sudden we look at today's day, which is Father's Day, and we're doing a lesson about how men need to keep their sexuality to themselves, you know, and to their wives. Interesting that that would be the ordained will of God to have this be for today. Now, hey, I did not ordain, I did not plan that. That was not something that I was like, you know, I didn't realize it until yesterday. I was like, oh my gosh, uh, the lesson for tomorrow is kind of poignant given the day that we and our society recognized as, as Father's Day. So just interesting food for thought. So with that being said, uh, understand the background to, to Proverbs and the fact that it's, it's words of wisdom shared to us by Solomon. And I always want to lead anything that we study in Proverbs by getting this, 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 this blurb out that is excerpt. If you were to read online, if you were to get in a newspaper ad, if you were to get a phone call or an email and it said, attendance is free, Please hear from the world-renowned wealthiest man ever on the planet with the most wisdom ever on the planet to share with you with all the power given on the planet, the insights that he would want to glean to you about what it is to live within that benefit of those blessings of wealth and wisdom and power. Would you attend that seminar? You probably would. Stop lying because you know you would. People say, I don't understand that. That's worldly stuff. Stop lying. One of those things will appeal to you. You want to know how this guy's dealing. And by the way, he's going to say to you, and it's in a... In a, in a a principle of insight onto godly principles. No, oh, sign me up, you know. Well, that's what Proverbs is about. And you add to it, oh, by the way, let's, let's go into um, gleanings at the end of life 
and thinking about things I would have done differently or things I learned from because I didn't do things differently. That's what Ecclesiastes is about. So wisdom, the wisdom of Proverbs is the early part of his life and the middle part, which is why if you're interested in Proverbs, interesting enough, you'll read the first half of Proverbs deals with a lot of sensuality and wisdom issues. The last half it kind of goes away from the adulterous sens sensual issues and more of a maturation of reflective issues and, and you know, kind of counting the stock and what's out ahead for you. You'll notice the, the, the passages about women and about adultery and about keeping yourself sensually in check is in the first half of Proverbs when he was younger and not so wise in that area. And then later on, he kind of gets his, his head in the right place and starts to reflect back. And then Ecclesiastes is the coup d'etat again of the end of life, reflections on all of that. So when you read Proverbs, remember, and I use this, and I, I can't help but think about uh, Solomon, obviously. And with that, I can't help but think about my brother-in-law, DJ, on this Father's Day that he is uh, deceased now of five years. And, and the reality is that you have to deal with the fact that when you look at this, you look at this fact that at his funeral, I said to people, he was a person who, and this is not to, you know, turn over on his grave. Just being honest with you, because we're talking about the issue of sensuality and a man keeping himself in check. DJ didn't do that. So he had over 100 issues of, of, of affairs with different women. So he was like an under Solomon. It was just crazy. Now, Solomon had 10 times that, uh, 10 times more than that. He had 1,000. So it's a lot, right? So the thing is, now, am I saying he was right for doing that? Absolutely not. But the point being... At his eulogy, I said, you know, when you think of Solomon, when you read your Bible, do you think of the, the young boy who was of wisdom, who was just so overwhelmed, he prayed before God with a broken heart, saying, Lord, just give me wisdom. I want to make the right choices and decisions to, to guide your people, for your decisions, for your judgment. Is that the guy you think about? Or the guy who's the philander and evil, devil, sensuality, uh, you, know, you know, depraved dude? Which one, the one who worships idols on, on mountains that he always set up in the different places? Which one do you think? Because it's the same guy. It's the same guy. That's what I talked about at, at, his, at his funeral, at his eulogy. And so it's the same thing here we're talking about. So for men who have been in, in, engaged in this, for men who, have, who are in it, have it in it, or about to be in it, I'm not judging you, okay? Understand that, first and foremost. I am not judging you, nor do I ever judge my brother-in-law, rest his soul. I loved on him where he was, and we, and we related. And he, he said to me that, he said, if Christianity was more like how I was exhibiting love to him, he'd have been better off embracing the Lord more. He turned away from the Lord because of how he was dealt with, because of how he did not do where Proverbs 5 warns people of, of this path. So when a man does get caught in this path, it's wrong, but how we react to it is all the more needful because it's a slippery slope for that person is to get pushed just the extra edge, and then they're out on the outside looking in. They don't really want to come back to the Christian fold because they feel like, why, why would I? All the condemnation, all the judgment, all the, all the, all the you know, BS of dealing with people. So no offense. I'm just saying that loosely because I personally know what it's like to deal with somebody who's been through that issue and they speak about it in such a, a bro if they are broken and if they are willing to come back in the fold, how do you react to them? Don't forget, don't be like the people in Corinth unto Paul who couldn't take back the lies that he took and they constantly judged him and damned him. And then four letters later, he said, you know what? Enough's enough. You examine yourself, guys. If you're so filled with love, why are you so filled with hate and bitterness toward me? I can't take back what I've done. And that's what a man who is in guilty of Proverbs 5 needs to be saying, if he's in the right state of mind, if he's committed these things, and he needs to come back to that place of that. And if he is in that place, where does that leave you and me? you got to be receptive. you got to be willing to forgive and be compassionate and embrace with the idea that he is willing to make right, if that's the case. I don't know that. But be careful of not saying, yeah, that scumbag, yeah, be yeah. Be careful because we were all that wretch in some way or another. We're picking on the man today, so women, please be careful. It could be you too. All right, so yes. Uh, Vicki said, I find what you're saying interesting since my Bible comments on this chapter as the theme of the immoral woman, uh, referencing chapter 2, 16 through 19. Here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. The thing is, the reason why it says the immoral woman is because the man is enticed away uh, by this woman, right? That's what the Proverbs 5 is about. But the proverb is charging the man. It starts off with, my son. Does it start off with saying, oh, daughter, don't be a harlot? It's not saying that, even though she's in the passage. So let's get, let's get real. It takes two, right? A man doesn't go off on his own because he just wants to. There's a woman somewhere who's seducing that process. So to your point, Vicki, yes, a woman is involved in this process. But 
to make clear that the book, the chapter starts and ends with my son, to make it clear who the context is thrusted toward, the man. The accountability is on him. Because nothing will happen if he wants this, if she is seductive and she is off the kilt of not living right, if he's living the right way, if he's chaste and disciplined in his mind and heart and will, nothing will happen. Because he'll do the right thing. There are those that go to the houses of ill repute. It's not like women seduce them. They went there to do it. That's, that's, because that's why I start off with this. The whole Proverbs, if you were to sum it up, it's stay yakar, disciplined, chastised, in your leb, in your heart, mind, and will. If a man stays that way, he won't go to those places. He won't give in to the woman who is trying to entice him out. It, it's, it won't happen. It's when he loses the discipline and, and chastisement of his own, of, of this yakar, of his own heart, mind, and will, then he's in trouble. You, you can't do that. And it's going to talk about that in Proverbs. That's, our, that's my preface for you. So now let's get into the meat of the, the first verse. Okay, so the first verse says, My son, and the word is, is, is beyond, <coughs> or bane, bane, you could say it, beyond, bane. It's, it's a word that is used to, 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 to denote the prodigy of the family line. It's almost like, imagine a Rockefeller, or a Carnegie, or a Morgan, or a Rothschild, right? Or a DuPont, or a Bush type of person who's got intrinsic wealth in their generations, right? Saying, My son. It's a whole different thing than a person who's impoverished or an average lay person saying, my son. The difference, the import's a lot more heavy-weighted because of the prodigy. So it brings along the prodigy. So who's saying, my son? God, unto Solomon. So when he's saying, my son, he's saying, consider whose you are. Consider the generational wealth of spiritual blessing from whence you've come. Do not be an ignoramus and discount who you are. All right? It's one thing for me to get involved in their repute, but if Prince Charles or Prince David or Harry does that, a little, a little stupid, a little stupid. They have a lot more to lose than me, right? There's a lot more to lose for a person who's given that title, my son, as a prodigy of the family inheritance. That's what's in view here, okay? So there's no coincidence he uses that phrasing to start off with, as if to say, would you please keep in mind the end in mind? Don't be ignorant with the pleasures of a season, right? So he starts off by saying that, and he says, attend, or the word is kashab. Listen closely. <laughs> the word may say hearken in some of your translations, or attend. To my wisdom, or chonika, or, or chokina, which is the same thing we use, you know, Sophia in the Greek language. It's, it's the wisdom, the, un, the depth of understanding of, with application of God. And extend, or nata, inclined, or bend your ear. You know when they, you remember the old commercials, we're old enough to know that E.F. Hutton, you know, the, the effect, people would go in like, what? Like, what? So when you say bend your ear, it's almost like when someone's talking, you kind of go like that. You, you do like this number. You, you lean in because you're really paying attention. That's what he's telling him. So remember who you are. Play close attention. Lean in because I'm about to tell you some stuff that you need to take with you for the rest of your God-given life. All right? My words to keep or watch and preserve. The word keep here is to watch and preserve my understanding, his tabuna. I love the word understanding here in the Hebraic sense. It's the discerning skill. Watch and preserve your discerning skill. What does that mean? Anything, you know, there's an, there's an old basketball coach named John Wooden. If you don't know him, uh, you don't have to love sports to respect the man who was a, he was a Christian guy, and he believed in taking principles and faith and imputing those into sports and athletics in a collegiate sense. So because he was in a collegiate professor in that sense, the professors at UCLA respected him as one who actually instructed the students the same as even greater than he did. He had a whole, you can read books about him that have nothing to do with sports, have to do with equipping a young man or woman, in this case men, to grow into who they're supposed to be. He was all about growing the young man. And so what he would start off with every, now in college you have, you know, four tiers of freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior, right? So every time the, the, the class would, you know, there's always an attrition of the, the one would fall off and graduate and a new class would come in. It didn't matter those middle three people already heard the same thing. He started off every season with saying, gentlemen, this is the basketball. Gentlemen, this is your shoe. This is how you tie your shoes. What? No joke. He would do this. He would go over the basics. And his comment was, I memorized it. He said, the basics are basics. And if they're not learned and honed and understood, more skills are lost in practice, in between practices than can ever be gained in practice. So think about that. So John Wooden, that's a principle you take in life. He's given them a life principle that he applied basketball to so it would stick with their thick skulls, but it was a life principle he was teaching them. Now remember where he was, UCLA, the whole free drugs hippie era. That's when he was getting his heyday. He was teaching that in that environment, just so you know. It wasn't like it was easy for him, okay? 
So that was a little hippie movement, all that stuff. So when he says watch and preserve the discerning skill, what he's meaning is keep your skills in between your time of spending time with God. When you're living your life, skills are lost more in between your time with God than, than you can gain when you're with God. So if you don't hone your skills when you're, when you're apart from God, when you're not in your Bible study time, you're not in your prayer time, if you're not honing your skills in between those times, you're not going to gain them back in that time. That's what he means by discerning skill. Watch and preserve it. Hone your skill of what this means to, to lean in and pay attention to God, to really to, to bend your ear, to listen closely to God. So it, it, he's just telling you that. He's, he's starting off with saying your habits are important. Does he make it clear or not? Your habits are important. First he says, remember who you are, my son, the prodigy declaration. Then he basically tells them how to do, how to, how to listen and pay attention, but he tells them it's important. It's in, the habits that you form are important. Know who you are, form the right habit. Verse 2, we'll read from the actual Septuagint and from the actual uh, you know, exegesis, which is based on the King James. So I'm going to read both because this deserves both in this particular uh, study. So again, verse 1 in the King James, My son, attend or hearken unto my wisdom, and bend thine ear to my understanding or discernment. Verse 2, that thou may re regard discretion, entry, that, 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 and that thy lips may guard or keep knowledge. Verse 2 in the Septuagint says, Now the sense of my lips, so verse 1 and 2, excuse me, My son, attend to my wisdom, and incline thy ear to my words, that thou may keep a good understanding. Now the sense of my lips, give thee instruction, give this, and in, excuse me, this injunction, excuse me, listen not to an abandoned woman. Say what? What's that talking about? When he says in here, now the sense of my lips, get, listen not to an and this and to not to this abandoned woman. And then again, the King James, he says, there's no. It's in verse three. He kind of gets ahead of him with saying what he verse says in verse two. But verse two, he says in the King James, thou may regard discretion or intrigue, that their lips may guard knowledge. Now, when, he, when he's looking at this, and in, oh, i got to read verse 3, actually, from the Septuagint, because they overlap a little bit. So the King James, verse 3, For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. Whereas in Septuagint, verse 3, he kind of gets the end of verse 2, is combining verse 3 a little bit. So i got to read verse 3 here in Septuagint. When he says, Listen not to an abandoned woman, he also says, For honey drops from the lips of a harlot, which for a while pleased Please your palate. Ye. So, and you look into this, and he says, listen not. In other words, do not do this. Do not bend your ear to the, to the, to the strange woman. What's a, what's a strange woman? By the way, when he says a strange, the strange woman, this word for strange, and I'm going to write it on the board for you so you know. So, it's, and we get, they get their, they, when they say strange, it means another, another, which, which they allude to an adulterer or adulteress, excuse me. You'll find some translations even say adulteress because it means another woman than the one you're with because he's going to end the, ver the chapter with go back to your wife of your youth. So he's talking about another woman. Which means, in the word here is, un, which is rur, means another. Which is why he says strange. Which is interesting because in the, in the actual uh, Septuagint he says abandoned woman, but in the King James he says a strange woman or a stranger. So in some translations it may say adulteress because that's what they get, they base the word on. I looked up the word adulteress. Interesting enough, you know what it really actually means in the actual Hebrew? It means he who sits in the seat of the father. Ooh, that's not cool. <laughs> so you're talking about, in other words, th that means that the mother and father lie in the bed, right? So a woman takes the place of the mother and the, and the, and the father's bed? No, 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 no. Oh, no, you do not. Oh, no, you do not. You don't do that. Now, remember, we're talking about the man here making this, making this indiscretion, right? But to Sister Vicky's point, let's get real. It, the woman's not off, you know, from not being guilty here. Let's get, why was she doing that? You know, like the thing with, now I'm about to get, Picking out Arnold Schwarzenegger, for example, but if she hit, he has a maid, he's wrong for what he did, wrong. But you ever think about the maid? She cared for the kids. She knew the the wife by name, knew the kids by name, cared for them, and then took the same bed that they lie in and made it her bed with him. How is she not 
the one who's the adulteress in this passage. Sure she is. But it's his fault, though. If I go to Proverbs 5, it's all on him. But let's not get, let's not get hasty here. She's guilty just as much. See, yes. I, I think you know, the, the wife is one flesh with this person, and she's got to reap the harvest of this. It's not something she sows, but she's got to reap it with him. I know. It's crazy. And it's, and we're gonna, it's, it's going to get, there's some poetic stuff we're going to get into Proverbs, and I don't want to get too racy. But just like Song of Solomon, we taught on this long ago. I mean, it was like maybe 10, 13 years ago, I taught on Song of Solomon. And I remember Kelly back to going, Preston, I got kids in here. And there she would she put her hands on her ears with Kelly and with McKenna and Morgan and, and Jamie. It was funny. Because that, there was some racy things in Song of Solomon, but I, I just was talking about it. Well, this chapter has some racy stuff in it. Um, we get to about chapter, verse 15 and on. It gets a little racy with some stuff that it's a little induendo there, a poetic nature he uses to talk about some sexuality stuff. But the reality is, we're, we're going to have to address it because it is what it is. Because he's, he's, he wouldn't bring, if it wasn't important, God wouldn't have put it in the book. Now, God did it in a poetic way to be respectful and not to be a deviant, which, by the way, that word is in this chapter. We get our phrase sexual deviant. That word is in this chapter. Deviant, wicked, perverse. Those words are in this chapter in Hebraic words. We're going to look at those as we go on. So again, he says in verse three, in verse two and three, that this, this, thou may regard, you may regard discretion, that thou may keep knowledge. Oh wait a minute, I gotta re erase this first before I put, I gotta put that on here first. The one, the, oh, I'm thinking of the one that said, "Let the his heart that takes knowledge." Oh yeah. He just went after Joseph, blatantly didn't even care to remember Potiphar was in that room, and she was not. No, he just left. He fled. No, he fled, right? Yep. And so he, may, he says that you may, and he says here again, you may, now he says keep here. He says, no, he says keep knowledge in verse 2. The, there's a word that's, that's for keep knowledge here versus the earlier word here. So here he says, he, he says to, to watch and preserve. And here it's more of a natsar, which means to more watch and guard. So they're both watch, but one's to preserve, preserve yourself in verse 1. Now he's saying watch and guard yourself. So one's a defensive and one's an offensive. Think about it. So shamar is more, is, is more, is more offensive. You're, you're, offen you're, you're taking offense. You're preserving yourself. When you're guarding yourself, you're taking defense because you're putting up your shield, if you will, because which means someone's coming at you. If you're guarding yourself, then someone's coming at you. Let's get real. That's a defensive posture. To guard yourself is a defensive posture. To preserve oneself is an offensive posture because you have to fight for your, for your life. So he's telling them offensive posture, defensive posture. An offensive posture, you have to actively engage in discerning skills to keep those sharp. You have to be a defensive posture to, to actually, to, what's he say? To guard knowledge. How interesting is that? You have to be in a defensive posture to guard knowledge, which I think is just sad because the reality is the word there is dof and, and the actual Hebrew. So in other words, so we have to take a defensive, whoops, a defensive posture to fight for the right way of thinking. And you know why that is? Because if he's saying, regard value, value what I'm saying to you, value discipline, he's telling them to take an offense, take a defensive approach to knowledge. Understand that the world view, other men's view, which is influenced by Satan, is to, is to distort and to change and to thwart what it is that God is imputing into you as a man. So what is other men trying to do? Take away from you what God's saying is true. You know, the world, I, I remember many a time people would say, oh, come on, God made you horny, so go ahead and just sow your wild oats. Um, I don't care what you say, that is wrong. Well, you can't argue with the sensuality of a man. I can argue with your logic that you base on that. So you can't argue with the fact that it's going to happen, so why not just give him a condom? Listen, your logic is flawed, 
and your thinking is, is, is ignoramus. And I have to guard myself. I have to not sar. I have to guard myself and my, the dolt and the knowledge of what God told me that that's boneheaded thinking. That is wrong and explicitly ignorant. But because I have to have a posture to fight the, for the right way of thinking. If not, if I let my, if my guard down, I start going, you're making sense, you know, it actually makes some sense. Then you're being stupid. You really are. No offense, but you're being raka. And I'm not supposed to say that. God says, don't say raka. You're being a moros, a moron. You know what right is. You're not doing it. Why would you do that? It makes no sense. But we do it all the time because you know, I'll tell you why. Peer pressure and testosterone because you want to fit in with the guys because the guys all say it. Well, my buddies say it. If I don't, I'm going to be the, the only one who's a weak, you know, wuss. You don't let your son go out with the, with the gals, man? No, I don't. You know? No. I don't. I don't let them just hang out with the gals, you know? No, I don't. No, I, I, we have conversations about that. You know, so, because how many men really say I love you to their sons? How many men actually hug their sons? How many men actually impute to their sons a sensual conversation about how it is that they should live their lives? How many have that conversation? I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm just saying. Not many. I had zero of that with my dad. Zero. Okay, so the reality is that you, you have to guard yourself. You have to not sar, take a defensive posture to fight for the knowledge that God has given, that that is the right knowledge, not the one the world gives, not the ones your friends give, not all that garbage. Because if you don't, then you're gonna, the strength woman's going to come in and say, yeah, you're already right for the picking. Your mind's already not in a defensive posture. Your guard's down. She just walks in and, well, okay, well, now she's got, she's already, you're already down. You, it's just like, it's just like, for example, in wartime. They, was it the Sun Tzu, the art of war? The battle's already won before the first you know, shot is fired, he always says. In other words, if you don't protect your borders, are you wondering why the enemy can slip right in and then you know, kill you from within? That's the abandoned woman. That's the strange woman. That's what she's doing. She's saying, oh, whoa, 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 wait, wait. Are you saying the guard's down? Are you saying your shield is not up? Awesome. I could slip right into your thought process, and next thing you know, I got you right where I want you. Because you're already not fighting for the way of thinking that's correct. I see you with no defensive posture. You don't care and value that as, as an important, and therefore I'm taking advantage of that. That's what she does. She, she hones herself in on people like that because Satan knows how to direct her toward those weak-minded men. No offense. For them, seek them out. That's the problem. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not trying to, again, I'm not... Wanting to pick on men, so probably Greg's probably thinking, hey, have Father's Day to me, man. What kind of message is this? You know, look, this is not a pick on men per se. It's a pick on the human condition that just so happens to be highlighted in Proverbs 5 within the man. Okay? So, women, please don't get upset with your man, your husband, your boyfriend, your, your whatever, your son, whatever. Just relax. Okay? Let's just understand that's the depravity of all of us because when it gets a little later in, in the passage, it's not going to speak so nicely about the woman in this passage either. Okay? And like, again, she's innocent. We said that already. We'll continue to make sure you don't want to get on a soapbox and say, yeah, those guys are a bunch of dogs. Yeah. The woman in this passage isn't so nice either. Okay? She's, she, so he's, he's the one who has the grill outside, and he, and he put the kerosene on, but she struck the match. And she's looking forward to the grilled chicken. So, it, so she's the one who wants the end result, and she's the one who's supplying the flame. He's the idiot enough to go outside and actually buy the grill, look outside and go, I, don't, I, I, I didn't know I was going to actually set that on fire. Well, how would you put the gas on, man? How would you not know that's what, that's what comes next? You can't, you're setting yourself up for failure when you don't, that, not sorry, when you don't take a defensive posture to fight for the knowledge of what God has given you. This, and leave. That's right. That's what, so, well, that's, that's coming later. That's not here yet. But there's a passage that talks about, yes, just split. Of course, in James, we know you're supposed to flee. But in this passage of Proverbs 5, he's going to talk about that too. So again, so we talked about, so in verse 3, I didn't put this on the board yet. So he says in verse 3, the strange woman. Now again, the strange, the strange, or I, I put the word on here, roar. So that's, that could, it says abandon. And this, they, they get their word adulterous from this. Even though it doesn't mean that in the actual word, it just means strange. So there's another word we're going to see later on for the word strange in English, but it actually means foreign. And that one, that word is more poignant for a harlot. So a foreigner, man, why is that? Because the Jews would say, later on you see the word strange in the next verse coming up, I think it's like verse 10. They're going to use the word strange to denote, well, amongst the Jews, when you were actually being enticed from the outside looking in, they were seen as harlots. 
because they didn't marry in their own tribe. They didn't worship one true God. They already were doing bestiality, other, other polygamous, weird, sensual stuff to worship their mono, polytheistic, weird God stuff they were doing. So the Gentile women are foreign, so they were, because they were foreign, they also were not chaste for the most part, and so therefore they saw them as a way of saying the word foreign is meant a harlot to them. So later on, he's going to say the word foreigner, which meant harlot, because mo all foreigners mostly were people that, women that weren't a one woman kind of guy, gal, excuse me. They weren't like that. They did many things that were religiously justified to worship their so called polytheistic gods, or because they were just Lucy and how they believed in their minds about just doing all that free love. So that's not here yet. This word is not foreign. This word means strange or abandoned or ruhr. They get the word adulteress from it. So again, he says that, that her. Her lips, it says, uh, are a drop as honeycomb, and her mouth is smooth as oil. Okay? So her lips, again, he goes on and say her lips drop as honeycomb. In other words, what does that mean? <laughs> and she sweet talks you, right? We get that all, we know what that means. So how does a woman sweet talk a man? Let's get real. Most of the people in this congregation are women. How do you sweet talk a man? You flatter him. Oh, you got good muscles. Oh, you're so cute. Oh, you're so that, you know. And you flatter him. Every man loves that ego thing, right? The egometer is, is a little bigger on some men than others. Trump, it's way off the chart, right? <laughs> so he's got a huge egometer. It's like, but, but every man's got, everybody has an ego, but men have a stronger one on most average basis than a woman does. It's more prevalent in a man. Because he has to lead and protect and, and you know and do that for his wife, so God gave us a different egometer, if as I call it, more than a woman. Now women can have stronger egos than men, no doubt about it. But it's all things being even, it's predominantly on the men's side where the ego is, is is visibly seen. And so the egometer, as I say, is what the woman uses sweet words of drops of honeycomb. She flatters him. Uses sweet words, sweet talker. She flatters him. All right. So that's something I say flattery. I remember, I remember one time, to give you an example of this, and how, how you're supposed to fight for a defensive posture. I tell people that work this, they go, boy, you're mean. No, I'm doing the Proverbs 5 thing. True story, at work, they said to me years ago, hey, I know somebody who likes you. I know somebody who thinks that you're hot. I go, okay, they know I'm married, right? They work here? Yeah. You tell them I said, um, excuse me, harlot. I'd appreciate if you don't have those thoughts said to me or anybody else from this point forward. Because you are a whore when you're saying that to me. You know that I'm married. Why are you saying that? You're a harlot. She goes, well, you're offensive. No, she's offensive. So I have a ring and she knows I have a ring. That is extremely offensive. It makes me angry. Because why would you say that to me? If you say, hey, you're looking, that's one thing. You said I was hot and I was sexy. No, don't say that. You don't say that. If you want to think it, that's your mind business. Don't say that. Shut your pie hole. Don't say that. Don't, gosh, I mean, she's so angry. I'm like, that's an offense to God, to my wife, to me, to my covenant. Are you serious right now? And so that point forward, believe me, nothing was said ever since after that. You never found out who the person was. I didn't care. I didn't care. There, there, was, there was one guy who came, who, there was one guy that I know in, in King the Believer, and he said he enjoyed that type of insight people gave to, I told him the story. He said, oh, I enjoy that. What's wrong with that? I'm not going to act on it. That's not the point. You're losing your defensive posture. Yeah. Now your thinking is, is allowing that to make you feel good. Then what's next? The, the sweet talk. That's what comes next. And then down the spiral you go. That's what she wants you to do. Go, it's, it's not that bad. It's okay. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. You're devaluing. The, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't like that. I shouldn't want that. Yes. Vicki said, you said that. When she said, when she, when she, when, when the lady said to me, when I, when I clarified what she meant, yes, I did. I did. I did. I said, when she said, you think I'm hot, you think I'm, because she said it, the, the, by the way, there's different ways of saying that. There's ways you can say it, you can say it in a very tongue-in-cheek way of saying, yeah, she thinks that, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of hot. That's, the, I, you can tell by the demeanor how people meant it. She meant it in a very sensual fashion, because she said it kind of like, do you want, she said it like, you know, like under the cover, under her breath, as if it was meant to be a sensual thing. So I didn't appreciate that at all. I know what she was meaning by it. You, you, can, you, can, you know what I'm saying? You know. You know when someone, there's a way of saying that. You could say things like, um, hey, he has a, a, a crush on so-and-so actress, or she has a crush on so-and-so 
actor. Men and women talk, talk that way all the time, loosely. That's not even, I can argue about that not being healthy, but that's a different thing, you know? When you might say, oh, I think he's hot, or I think she's hot. That, that's fine in, in some way or another if that's for your level of communication. There's a different demeanor, though, when you take a tone that you're, in, you're inciting a sense of, does that interest you? How do you feel about that? Well, when, you, I think, when you know, someone says, hey, I think so-and-so actress or so-and-so actor is hot, there's no way you're going to ever meet that person. So you're just saying that as a reference to their physique or their demeanor or whatever, whatnot. Still, I would argue would be wrong, but I could see how it's not the same thing as when someone is literally in your life circle of everyday occurrence and they're saying to you something that would entice you to or explicit or, or solicit a response. That, that's a little different. I'm just telling you, it's a little different. It's a lot different. It's just like me saying, I don't, I don't like the deep ocean, for example. So when you, when you talk to me about marlins and, and, and catching deep sea fishing, that's it's fascinating to me. But I'm not going to be ever face to face or even in the position of being with a great white or a marlin or something like that. But, so, but, but if I was deep sea fishing, if I did that every single weekend, and you're talking about great white sharks and marlins, that's more practical now that that's the reality because I'm in that world where that is, in fact, where I do go. That is, in fact, where I am exposed to the possibility of those things, right? So when you're in the world of that possibility being more reality, then the comments are differently weighted, I would argue. Most definitely. I think you understand that too, right? Yeah. yeah. As a man, the woman who thought you were hot approached you through a third party. Another As woman. A woman, when I was at work, oh, I got to find out who it was. That it's gross. Yeah, it's gross. Yeah. I mean, at least you, you didn't have to but, look at the person but I, that but 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 to my but to my own dismay of my own uh, sinful reality, I'm not gonna sit here and say I'm the best guy on the planet. Here's the thing: when we first got married, we moved to Chattanooga. The opposite happened. A year into our marriage, someone did say that to me, and it and it wasn't the same reaction. The reason I'm such a harsh reaction now, because I did the opposite of what I, was, I didn't take a defensive posture early on in our marriage. I thought that was kind of nice. Someone would see I was attractive, and so I thought that was great. And so the next thing you know, there was an advance at me, and I was like, oh shite. I didn't know that was going to happen, but stupid me should have known that because I let down my shield. And that's why I'm so adamant now, so I don't care who I offend. I'd rather offend some third party, some third party chickadee, some female who gets her, her feelings hurt. Good. I'm glad. Would you rather have that or my marriage destroyed? Excuse me, I have a history here of my biblical understanding and plus God already exposed me a year into our marriage of knowing, don't be a doofus, Preston. I already fell for that before. Well, that feels good. And, I, and, I, and all of a sudden, there was an advance at me. I was like, oh my God, I didn't mean that. No, 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 no. And I realized what this meant after the fact. And that's why I'm so adamant now, because I've already been exposed to both sides of that fence. So folks who say I'm overreacting, you don't know my life, man. You don't know my life. And you don't know how I understand exactly what you're just talking about. I've been down that path. It is not cool to just say, oh, that's fine, okay. You tell her I said hi. No, you don't do that. <laughs> you don't do that. You don't say, oh, I think, who is it? 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 I don't care who it is. I don't care who it is. As long as my wife finds me attractive, that's all I care about. That's it. That's all I care about. So, yes. The messenger in this particular case recently uh, went his way. What, what was the answer? That was, not, that was like 10 years ago. Well, but how did she deliver the message? She was shocked. Because she was she was shocked. Like, good gracious. Well, I mean, so that was your reaction, but did she deliver it? Like, I don't know. I, would, I don't know. I don't know. I wasn't. I never. I never. I never knew who the person was. So I didn't know how it was delivered. I mean, the woman told you. She delivered it very, very, you know, under the cover, like it was. Okay. It was in a very sensual way. You can tell that she wanted to elicit a sense of, "Am I interested?" Yeah, that's what I'm there was an illicit so sense of, "Am I interested?" She was looking to see my interest level. You could tell. Do I go that way? Kind of thing. I'm like, no, no, I'm not doing that. So, and that, and that's what men get in trouble with. They let their guard down and think, "Oh, what's a bit's a big deal? Get my ego stroked." Because once you get your ego stroke with, with, with slick words, it, it's, a, it's a slippery slope, my friends. And they go, oh, come on, words don't hurt nobody. <laughs> really? Okay, then don't say I love you then, and don't say I do at the altar then. Don't say that. Words mean nothing, right? Then don't say that at the altar then. See what your wife says to you. See what your soon-to-be bride will say to you when you go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, right. No woman's going to be okay with you just nodding your head unless you're a mute that's excused. But if you're a person who can talk and you don't say nothing, come on. Get real. Words do mean something. So don't fall for that idiocy. Yes. Uh, Vicki said, how would you address a man who does that to a woman? What word equivalent to harlot would you call him? <laughs> <Easy one. sighs> 
But gigolos or gigolo? No, that's different. That's different. No, it's um, actually um, the word that we're going to use in the book of Proverbs is going to be a man, there's a couple words, a man who is wicked, perverse, iniquitous, a person who is, it was twisted and turned around and bent, which is what the word perverse means. Perverse and iniquity means a person who is bent and twisted. So you're bent and twi you're bending and twisting God's word. Your whole mind is bent and twisted by your sensuality. So you're being a perverse person. You're, you're, you're deviating from the word of God. You're a deviant. So a person who does that, two words to describe them. Perverse, deviant. Simple enough. It's that easy. No man wants to be called a deviant, a sexual deviant, and a perverse man. You call that to a man, he's labeled for life. That's like a sexual predator label right there. You're done. You can't you imagine a job vacation? Yeah, I'm known for being a sexual perverse and deviant. But that's okay, though. Women love it. Uh, no, I don't think so. They would not hire you with that on your resume if you start with that, right? I'm a perverse and deviant person in, se in sexual arena issues. <laughs> okay. Uh, see you later. We're not hiring you, you know. Who's going to hire you unless you're going to some ill repute place, I guess. But that's what I'd call a man in that situation. Again, from scriptural standpoint, perverse and deviant. What they call it wicked and iniquitous. It's the same word in the actual well, Hebraic. Trying to provide that October surprise. Yeah, but he actually was. He was that way. He was, he is perverse and deviant. Yeah. He does he does the very thing we're not supposed to. He does let his guard down. He enjoys that. That's not good. He's a he's what they call they say locker room talk. That's a way of saying he's a man's man. That's a way of saying that he does what most men think is okay. Alpha man. It's not okay. I, I know it's it's a tendency doesn't mean it's okay. It's just like saying a woman's tendency is to guard over her children and love on them and not let them grow as an adult, man or woman, doesn't care if a boy or girl doesn't matter, right? As a mother, you gotta let go. You cannot always baby your child. You got to let them go. But it's a tendency you have for the right for the for the innate nature that you have. I'm giving a that's a not as bad not the same example, but it's similar to that in that you have a tendency to to want to guard and protect your child, but sometimes to a fault. You gotta cut the umbilical cord. You gotta cut the umbilical cord. Well, a man justifies the same innate nature of saying, well, I'm already sexual that way, so if I have every now and then a chance of doing that, that's my way of justifying, that's how I let my steam off. No, it's wrong. Yes? Um, a transition gigolo, that's a man. Remember American Gigolo, the movie? Yeah, that's, I know, but that's not the same thing here. This guy's not, this guy's more of a perverse deviant. He's not. We're not getting involved yet in the description of a man who's doing this on a constant basis of, of a revenue, if you will, as a heart that does it for money and for her practice of life. So this is not, this guy's not described as that yet. He's being described as a son who's being deceived and being, again, giving in to this temptation from without. So he's not right now, I wouldn't, it's not fair to call him a jiggler. It's not fair. It's not what he's doing. He's being enticed and being foolish enough to let his guard down to entertain being struck away down this path. Yes. Oh, yeah. I didn't read a whole bunch about it, but it seemed like eight women in one night, and I'm just like, oh, brother. Oh, yeah, he was a deviant. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah, he was. And, and he was. When Roger Moore passed away, there was another He's the same way. Him. He's the same. There are most, most, oh, most men are. It's why most women will say all men are dogs, stuff like that. Hey, whatever. I'm not. You can kind of understand the other side of thinking about our current president. You know, they were, they're in such a fight about his um, view on things. You know, that, that can really. So when she when he says her mouth is smoother than oil, he's talking about her her little like her, her sensual kisses that she wants to, you know. Because you know how women do that, they put the lipstick on the on the thing, you know, right? Let's face it, a man can't put that on something you go as a woman, oh wow. But men go, ooh wow. <laughs> Different reaction, yes. Biggie said, right like a normal man who is not trying to make money by it. And Trey said, Okay, I thought you were asking male version of well, 
No, Vicky was asking that if I call the woman the harlot in this scenario, I'm calling the man the depraved, perverse person. And this, now the opposite of a harlot, in a technical term, yeah, you'd say jiggle, but we're not. In this context of this chapter, if a woman who is in, engaged in this behavior, she's a harlot, what's the man? He's a depraved uh, person who has been, he, he's, he's, more, he's a deviant. He's a depraved, deviant, perverse person. Well, he's all depraved, but he's the perverse deviant. And this description. Okay, so you're two different things. Opposite of harlot, yeah, gigolo, fine. But in this situation, the man is the perverse deviant. She's playing the harlot role, he's playing the perverse deviant role in this chapter. Okay, I'll make sure we're clear on that. Yeah. So anything else, babe? Sorry. No, and Vicki said no. My question was asked of uh, Preston's comment that a um, woman in his office calls him hot. Yeah, so that was, uh, that was a thing long ago. That was like over 10 plus years ago. So now I just remembered it. Little things like that were just kind of remembered to remind me of things like this passage. So, was, so some guys will say to me, you don't know what it's like. Yeah, you don't, don't lie to me because, no, you're just saying that because you want to justify your actions. But my job is to make sure I can relate to you but out without condescending you and judging you. So I'm not judging you for giving in to that. I'm not saying that for those men who have given into this stuff so far. You're like, oh man, he's going to think I'm a jerk. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that what I am saying to you is let your guard down. You did not, you did not, not star your knowledge of what you knew was right. Fact. If you have been engaged in being, a, being a, a victim of this, then you clearly, according to scripture, not according to me, you have not kept your tsar, you have not kept your watch and guard, your defensive posture was not up, and because of it, you let your knowledge of God get influenced by the outside world, other men, and this woman, and they sweet talk to you, she sweet talk to you, and her little sensual kisses, her smooth and oil, made you go, ooh, whatever, right? So then, then you go to verse four, they were pleasing to your palate, right? Verse four, but in the end, but in the end, you will find it better than bitter, bitter than gall, and sharper than a two-edged sword. That's the Septuagint, King James. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her end is bitter. <laughs> See, verse four. The end, or the actual phrasing here. I love it, and the actual. It's, it's the phrasing we should say afterwards. It's, it reminds me, it reminds me of those people who have these one night stands, or who have these single life mentalities of putting notches in their belt or notches in their bedpost, whatever. They act like their life is so grand. Afterwards, they don't feel so good. They can say what they want, but afterwards, they feel horrible on both sides of the fence, women and men. Maybe not right away, but in time they do. Oh, yes, they do. And that's what he's saying in verse 4. In the end, or the afterwards is the actual Hebraic word. Afterwards. The afterwards. So, let's see. I put here flattering. I'm going to put also on these. She's also manipulative. Yeah, yeah. So the woman uses smooth words to be flattery and manipulative, and her end, again, is a bitter is, is more bitter than gall. And the word gall is wormwood. And if you're wondering about wormwood, that's in the book of Revelation, mentioned when the wormwood hit the water, it turned bitter, it says in Revelation chapter 8, right? So you do have a reference to how wormwood in the New Testament is referencing also a relevance to bitterness. Yes? Um, and Vicki said, my Septuagint says in verse 3, for a season, who for a season please thy palate. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> which pleases, it's, yeah, for which for a while pleases your palate. Yep. And, what, and what, that's why in verse 4, it's a better, that's why the Septuagint does a good job in verse 3. Because it brings more, when you say for a season, because seasons come and go, right? So then it's like people say, I love fall. Yeah, but afterwards all those leaves fall off, right? <laughs> so, so who likes the cleanup? Raise your hand. Yeah, don't lie. No, you don't. No one likes, nobody likes the foliage. No one likes the cleanup, right? So it's the afterwards. It's always, he's just giving perspective of, yeah, there's the beautiful moment that you're thinking is wonderful. Her smooth talks, her wet kisses, her, 
or flattery or manipulation is so wonderful, then he's, but look where, laughter is where she leaves you. She leaves you in disarray. Your life is shambles. That's why the great Septuagint translation of for a season is a perfect way of getting your mind to think, well, a season comes and goes. That, that means there's a before and an after, which is why verse 4 is better poignantly known as the word the finality or the afterwards leaves you bitter. Because you're like, I wanted that fall to last every season of the year, but it doesn't. It comes and goes, just as the way she makes you feel will come and go. That's the point, to your, to your point. It's an afterwards. More bitter than gall, <clears throat> more bitter than gall or wormwood, because it's temporary. Temporary pleasures for a season, right? To your point, right? <clears throat> but, in verse, but in verse 4, he says, sharper than a two-edged sword. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> sorry, the word for it, it pleasures for it, temporary pleasures, and he says sharper than a two-edged sword. The funny thing is, the word here for sword is the word for mouth. And it's almost like the phrasing that he's using in a poetic nature when he says a two-edged sword, the word for mouth there is being used, or pe. It's almost as if she's talking out both sides of her mouth. She's saying on one way, oh baby, oh baby, oh baby, oh, how awesome you are. When all along she knows dang well she is there to use you for your money, <laughs> for her own pleasure, for her own agenda, for her own manipulation of whatever her end in mind is, right? But let's face it. You, you're not her love. You never were. You were a means to an end. And that's what he means by it's temporary. She'll leave you more bitter when you realize you didn't love me. No. You were just a thing for the day, for the moment, for a season. And now you're done. I'm done with you. you say what? But I gave everything up for you. You should have thought about that before. Yikes. Not cool. You mess with pot. If you have anything to do with pot, you'll mess with pot. That's right, Esau, right? That's why it says sharper than a two-edged sword. I think it's interesting. It doesn't say the word's not sword. It's actually the word mouth. Interesting. Interesting to me. I think it speaks to her double-minded, speaks to him, says one thing but means another. She's just two-faced, right? Verse 5, her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on Sheol. That's King James. Septuagint, for the feet of folly lead them who indulge themselves with her down with death to the mansion of the dead or Sheol. <clears throat> I love when it says again the feet of folly. So in the, in the King James doesn't say it says her feet go down to death but it, interesting in the Septuagint he says for the feet of folly lead them. In other words her feet go down to death but it's your folly that follows after. You know so she's leading you but you're following. That's just pretty ignorant. But interesting where he says, and it says the, the lead him, where it says the feet lead. That word lead there <coughs> is, is, so it says, it means to take hold of. Oh, excuse me, not take hold, excuse me. Ah, sorry. Uphold. Uphold, and it's the, the Hebrew word tamak. So what's that mean? When you say, you think of someone say your, your feet are upheld in folly. What is that supposed to mean? It's almost like, you know, when you have a good moment, you say, boy, I'm floating on air. There's the imagery here in the poetic nature he's talking about. He's talking about the fact that she's got you so wrapped up in what she wants you to think that she's taking a hold of you. That you're just, you're, she's, you're, she's, she's got you in her spell, as they say. She's got you where she wants you. You're in her spell. No one can tell you otherwise. Hey, Preston, you know that all she's doing is, yeah, yeah, but do you know? You don't, you don't see it. You're so blinded by the truth because she's got you under her spell, as they say in romantic novels, if you will. But she's got them under that spell, which, by the way, it's interesting because women can do that to men far more than the other way around. It does happen the other way around. But the reason why it happens more often than men to women is because of the Proverbs telling you that, yeah, both play a part, but let's get real. Men are usually the ones who can end this all. 
women are used by Satan to cause the problem, but men are used by Satan to proliferate the problem. That's like making the Bathsheba. Yeah. All of a sudden, out there on that rug. Men proliferate it. So you can have the cause all you want of a problem. If you have a, if you have no one proliferating it, then the cause is sniffed out. It's like how, it's like having a disease out there, a virus. Not that women are a disease. I'm not saying that, but deviant ones are, right? But if you have a cure for that disease, then the disease is irrelevant, isn't it? It's irrelevant. And then, too, David it's irrelevant. thought he wasn't supposed to be. He wasn't supposed to be there anymore. <laughs> no, he's looking over there going, ooh, look at her. You know, it's, 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 that's right. There's, there's so many viruses. There's so many strands of viruses out there. <laughs> that's right, right. Don't even think about it. Right? So, so he says that her folly descends to death. So he, when he says this, he leads them. And I love how when he says... Her, when he says her steps, I should say love, but it's sad. When he says her feet go down or her steps take hold, the word for her steps, when he says, oh, well, I should say folly. First of all, folly, let me get this, um, which is basically means foolish. Foolishness, we get the word moros, right, from that, from the Greek, from the Greek word moros, which means you know what's right. You know right, but you don't do it. When you know right and don't do it, what, what do we call that? You know what you call that. You think about it long and hard, by the way. So if you're in a situation, there's a loved one that you know who has a problem with alcohol or drugs or any other kind of thing that you can get, what's that word? Addicted to. Addiction means you know it's wrong but you can't stop yourself. You can't stop yourself. So she's got, so that whole, you know, that, that old song, what is it, Addicted to Love? Yeah, he's addicted to fornication. Her smooth talking words has got him under her spell so much, he's addicted to it. He wants more of it. And that's why it says folly, because he's addicted. She's got him addicted to it. And that's why it says folly, because folly means foolishness. Get the Greek word moros, which means you know what right is, but you won't do it. Why would you, do, why would you not do what's right knowing it's right? Because you're addicted. Because your pleasures, your, your, your habits dictate. I, I tell you right now, you can see in front of a person. I can, I've been there. A person who's involved in drugs or alcohol. And you sit there and you say, look, here's your wife. Here's your kids. Here's your grandkids. Here's your mom, your dad, your brother. And they go, we love you, we love you, we love you. And they go, they reach for the bottle anyways, and they drink it. Why would you do that? They don't mean to say, I don't love you. They're just saying, I can't help myself. Like the old story, the scorpion and the frog. That's what I do. That's why I stabbed you in the back. Sorry, that's what I do. That's what they do. When addicts do what they're used to doing, even though they know it's wrong. To they justify it in their mind. They, they, that's an example of justification. Yeah, you just just, like, I'm, there's no redemption for me. It's probably where it starts with, I guess. I don't know where it starts. I've never been there. But when you, I don't want to be there. That's a sad place to be. When you're an addict to something, and you come out of that, Boy, God love you. That is a tremendous conquering thing that God has given you to get over. And anybody who's been through that, God love you. That is a difficult, difficult thing. And so that's all respect for that situation. And I don't want to debilitate that situation because I know that there's many ways you can be an addict to different things. And by the way, there's people that are sexual addicts, right? Because there's no such thing. Well, th this is proof of it right here because her smooth talking words get him in their spell because now she, he's, she's taking hold of him. She's, he's, he's, up, he's, she, he's upheld by her words. In other words, hang on every word that she says. And now such a way that he does folly. Things that he knows are wrong, he still does it anyways. Because he's addicted to it. The pleasure of what she brings to the table makes him look past everything else. I'm like, I'm so stupid. But it's just, but that, that's, what, that's what happens. It's just so, you know, it's infuriating. It's infuriating. Oh. Trying to separate the mental from that chemical need or whatever, especially with drugs, oh. um, that's why you have such a, a difficulty. When it says, by the way, her steps, the word there for her steps, the phrasing is, it's, it's this tassad. And you know what that means? That means you're in step. Oh. Like, like unto marching, by the way. It's the phrase you would use for marching. You know, you've, we've all been there. You've seen loved ones. You've seen it. Where they, you, say, you say to them things like, you're not thinking for yourself. 
You're saying what she's saying. Right. Because they're in a tassad. They're walking in step. Whatever she says, he says. Whatever she goes, she does. He does. Tassad. T-S-A-A-D. It's mean, it means your, it, mean, it doesn't mean yeah, her steps. It doesn't just mean, I love the King James. It says steps later. No, no. It means in step. It's the word they use for marching. So you would say things like, the tribes of Israel were tassad around Jericho. They were in step, Jack. They weren't like going, hey, you march, and then I'll just go whatever I want to. No, they were in step, man. They were in unison. They were in unison marching around Jericho. So that, that shows a unison, a uniformity, a congruence of like-mindedness, which is not healthy in this addictive mentality. No wonder it's like the, like the Pied Piper, you know? All right, to the dead, right? That old, that old what is it? There's the nursery rhyme, is it a nursery rhyme, I think it is, or a fairy tale, the Pied Piper, you know? Yeah. What is that? Yeah, they're using a song. Come on, say, follow me, I'm a Pied Piper. Kind of yeah, yeah, that's what she's doing here. She, at this point, she's the Pied Piper. So what, so think about this. As we, as we pause for a minute, as, as we pause for a minute, as she's the Pied Piper here, right? She, she's the Pied Piper. Well, use and music. I mean, in USA, they have a pretty big thing there. So as she's the Pied Piper here, what led the man to just go, I know whatever she says I'm going to do, whatever she goes I'm going to go. What, what led him to be so doofus-like to do that? Well, before this, he was addicted. That's why he follows everything she says wherever, wherever she goes. Okay, so to be the Pied Piper to get you to do whatever she says and wherever she goes, it first gets you addicted. How does she get you addicted? She takes a hold of you with her spell. Well, how does she get a spell on you? Well, let's go back and see. Oh, because she talks sweet talk to you. She does, she's two-edged. She's a double-minded, double-mouthed girl. So, so what she does, she sweet talks you with manipulation and flattery. And how does she do that with her sensual kisses and her sweet innuendos? Well, how does she, how, well, wait a minute. How would she even get to that point? Because you let your guard down. You st stupid. Keep your guard up. All that is because you didn't do this. Well, you know? The, the men that go to the <laughs> you know? they don't need all this. I mean, they just go for that. I know. But it reminds me of, it reminds me of, I, I've watched these, uh, I, I love the, the, the wartime mentality of the Spartans, when their shield would go up and they'd join in unison, shield like a, like a shell over their head when the arrows would come and bound like this, and they push forward, and they push forward. If men would together do that, their strength in numbers, but they don't do that. They're so timid and so afraid and embarrassed to share their own sensual depravity issues with each other or their weaknesses, so they don't, so what they do is they fight their war themselves, and they can't guard themselves from all around. But if you have a bunch of men, you can form a shell around yourself, which is why there's always these safety. In Dobson figured that out when he did a whole study on this whole pornography issue with men. There's safety in numbers. You got to have a somebody. If you're struggling with this, then you got to have a somebody who can shield you from all around. And so it's interesting how the Spartans would put their shield up. Think about in wartime. If you put, imagine you fighting in the days of gladiator days back in Rome, or in the days of the Greeks. <laughs> you had your shield down. You like this the whole. Yeah, you had it. It's on your arm. You you like this constantly fighting. Why why would you, at what point do you not think you're going to get an injury? I mean, come on, you can't just fight. If you have a shield, why is it sitting down here for? Well, leave, put it up. Put it up. Well, if you're right, whatever, left or right-handed, whatever you are, put your shield up, man. Who fights like that? Who has a shield and goes, oh, I just have it for decoration, and I don't like it. It's too heavy to put up, man. It's just a pain in the butt, you know? So go ahead and just hit me in the sword right here, if you don't mind, because I don't, you know. Why would you do that? So adult, this all thing happened because the guy was being a moros, a moron, a fool, by not using what God gave him, the knowledge God gave him, the doth, he didn't take a defensive posture and said, no, I'm not fight. I'm not gonna let you have those thoughts of other men, society, or this woman's words come in over my shield and get into my head. No, 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 no. Cut it off before it happens. All this so far is because of that one thing. People go, how did this happen to you, Preston? How did this happen to you, whatever? Because you let your guard down. That's why it happened to you. That's why. Remember the old mythology story when Ulysses tied to the mast? He had his men tied him to the mast because he wanted to listen to the siren song, but he didn't want to say the consequences. Oh. <laughs> remember that? Remember I don't remember that? that. No, I don't remember that. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, whatever their song was, I mean, he didn't want to succumb to it and, and have the consequences, but he wanted them to hear it. Uh, curiosity, whatever you want. But he, and he, so he was tied to the mast, and then they passed by, and it never said what happened. Yep. You know, by the way, here's, here's interesting. If you don't keep your guard up, forget, forget the sensual thing for a second. The principle is if God's doth, his knowledge, 
is not what you hold as your defensive posture against all those onslaughts of sensuality or other ill repute religious thought processes. You'll give in to not just the, you, you, might, you may be holding strong against the harlot, but you may give in to the idiocy of off the cuff religious thought processes of Ron L. Hubbard or Ellen G. White or some other, you know, you know, is the guy's name Rude, the guy who has the Hebrew Roots movement. You, you may give another. So the whole the whole principle is the same thing. The principle is the reason you go down a path of idiocy is because you, the man, we, me, y'all, us, don't keep our guard up. It's that simple. Oh, it's that simple. Keep your guard up. And how do you do that? Well, remember who you are, the prodigy, and and listen closely and hone your discerning skill. That's how you keep your guard up because you realize the value of it, the purpose of it the way to use it the best way. That's why you, when you value it and you understand how you could use it to benefit you, you would really see the, the, the reality becoming a thoughtless way of you just always do that. I call it thoughtless execution. You don't think about it, you just do it. It's always up. You don't think about it. Now the hedge of protection thing in advance. I mean, I know my, I'm sure my grandfather prayed the hedge of protection and I prayed a prayer that I know now was a hedge of protection and I was asking someone and she had a friend of mine, she said, yeah, you, you would have been a casualty of that guy that was after you for three decades if you hadn't hedged. And I'm like, wow. No, yeah. And, a and it just welled up out from out from within me. Like, Lord, if it ends in divorce, I don't want the beginning. I don't care whose fault it is. I don't baptize God. I care what's at the end. I don't want the beginning. Just prayed that as a teenager. Like, so I, I, you know, whether someone prays the hedge of protection for you or where it wells up when you pray it for yourself. Yeah. Uh, and that all comes, what you just said, it all comes from me. I guarantee you. Any man, and this is not to make a shot, if you're hearing this for the first time, I'm not making a shot at you, but me or you or anybody else, if, you, if you're a male gender of this species, a human race, I can guarantee you, if you've been led down verse 3 to 4's passage, if you've been led down this path, it's because you forgot the value of who you are in the future of what God has in store for you. So don't, don't lie to me because you know darn well it's true. And you also know, even if you thought about doing it, it's because of that process, and because of also you didn't hone your understanding, you didn't hone your discerning skills. In between your time with the Lord, you weren't honing those skills because you thought in between your time you wouldn't hone it. You could regain it each time you're with the Lord. And remember, you can never gain back your skills. They're lost more in between your time with God than with you can gain them with your time with God. You've got to hone your discerning skills when you're not with God on those, on those really, you know, intimate fashions of study and prayer or worship, whatever you want to call it. You know, the, the time when we live our lives, when you're out in the place of, the world. You're walking around with other people. You have to have those skills honed. So I guarantee you, those two things are the are the dogging earmark of every man's debacle in this area. And this, it's, it's all face it. Let's all admit it, because I know I can admit it. It's because I lost value for who I was in the future, in God's eyes, as a prodigy of his blessing of wealth bestowed upon me. And secondly, I didn't hone my skill in between my time with God, and I thought I could always gain it back when I had my time with God. And you tend to devalue that place of every day you spend more time in between your times with God than you do with God so you have to make sure that you're honing that skill in between those times if you're not doing that you're not going to see the value of keeping your guard up and not to mention you're not going to be doing it innately because you're supposed to be doing it supposed to be like breathing you're supposed to just like brushing your teeth you get up in the morning you start you're supposed to just walk out your door like this and spiritually speaking as a man with God's knowledge and your defensive posture I know how I view myself I know how God sees me I know how I'm supposed to view my wife and my family and I will have my guard up. No one will take that from me. If you walk out your door like that, there's not going to be a chance for this, this, this disgusting woman to come in there and go, ooh, you know. All that stuff happens because she sees you. Oh, guard down. Sick. And she goes and gets you. When your guard's down, you're free prey. Remember, Job was not messed with by Satan because of what Udensi was saying. A hedge of protection was around him constantly from God. Take the hedge away, Satan goes, really? Well, that's free game. And the best way to get to a man is through a woman. So he just goes, ah, ha, ha. Let's go use her. So it all starts with us having that posture. So anyway, I'm, like, I'm, I'm kind of preaching at you. Um, so now let's go to verse 6. In verse 6 when he, he says, <clears throat> Her steps indeed are not established, for she walks not in the ways of life. Her paths are slippery and not easily known. That's step 2 again. In the King James he says, Lest thou should ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou cannot know them. All right, so later on, it's going to say in the last part of this chapter that God's going to ponder the man's paths. And that's an ongoing 
process of him evaluating you. So what's it saying here? In the early part of it, it says, You ponder, lest thou ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, and thou cannot know them. So what she's saying here is, again, they're not established. In other words, if you were to actually, if you were to actually ponder, which is an ongoing ongoing thought, if you were to do that, if you did that, you would see that her ways aren't established in verse 6 in the King James, that her, way, that, that her ways are movable, which means her ways are not known beforehand. Not if you did that, so if you did that. you would know her ways are movable, which means not known beforehand, which, by the way, is the wording that God used for Jeremiah when he says, I yada, I knew you before the, were you were in the womb. I yadad you. Here he's saying, you are not before, you are not yadad. You do not know beforehand her ways because you're not God. Don't act like, oh, I know this is going to end. No, you don't. She will use you for her own devices. And when she's done with you, she's done with you. She says when it ends, not you. That's how it's going to work. And you'll, she'll do it when she wants to, how she wants to, when she wants to. And you don't know when he says, if you, if you did ponder, if you did have the ongoing thought, if you did do that, you would go, um, this has to end. There's no good end to this. Because what's going to happen to my wife and kids? My, my family? My, one day when I'm a granddad? How am I going to explain this? If you thought about that, you doofus, you might go, wow. Um, then, yeah, she didn't really talk about that beforehand, did she? Of course she didn't. She wants you to think about it. so Because she doesn't want to bring it up. That's for darn sure. She doesn't want you thinking about it. Because she wants you left with the car carnal collateral damage of all of the actions that you've done with each other. And that's the whole thing. So I have to get hard on you, my apology, but come on, man. If, you, if you're in that situation, get out of it. If you've been there, admit where you are, learn the lesson. And yes, I'm giving you some tough talk, but no, I mean it in love. I mean it in the sense of I've been there in situations where I was tempted this way. I've already mentioned that. I did not give in to this, but I could have. And so I'm sensitive to it. My brother-in-law did. And let's just, just so you know, we love you where you are. It's okay that you're a sinner. It's not okay to embrace your sin. Okay? There's a difference. All right? It's okay that you're a sinner and you've fallen into the trap of sin and Satan's got you in the snare. It's okay. We all have. But it's time to stand up. It's time to take back your value of who you are. It's time to understand, to fight for the knowledge of what you know is right. Take your defensive posture. Stand up. Be the soldier that God calls you and wants you and desires you and made you to be. Stop being a wuss, being walked over and led along like a, like a slave, like you're just being told to go wherever your desires and she lead you to go. Stop it. Be the man that God wants you to be, disciplined, chastised in your heart and mind and, and, and will to do these things. So I'm just encouraging, imploring men are in this situation. Come on, man. All right? I'm not getting ugly at you. I'm just saying Come on. So when he says that, that, that her ways are not known, again, on the Septuagint, he says her paths are slippery and, again, not easily known. Her paths being slippery, her paths, her paths are slippery. And what that means, what's it say in the actual King James? It says slippery. Her paths are movable. Yeah, it says they. Yeah, it says they're. Yeah, they're slippery. Yeah, okay. So, so not known beforehand, they're slippery again. So they they make you wander. Because if you imagine, imagine you. And I never gone hunting, but I know people who have gone hunting. And if you go hunting, or you go on some kind of adventure trip to the forest, or to the mountains, or some kind of a you know, nature trail where there's dangerous aspects involved. If there's a mudslide and it takes you off the, the path, what happens? 
That's why it says the word slippery, because you could slip and you could fall, and next thing you know, you've wandered off the path. Now you're so far disorientated from where you were, it's hard to find your way back. So you can't get back the way you came. You have to find your way back another way. And that way is through people that don't condescend, that don't judge, that don't hate, that don't have bitterness, because you yourself will have bitterness, as he said before, because he afterwards, she'll leave you bitter because of her temporary you know, season of love that she gave to you. So it's up to us in Christ to embrace you where you are and say, you know what? It's okay. It's okay you've fallen off and you've wandered from the way. We can't get back the way you came. We've got to go back a different way because she's made you wander off the path so far. We can't go back the way you came. The way you fell off, we can't redo that. We've got to build another bridge to get back. So that's interesting. God leads you back a different way. So she, that's why he says that she's, you've wandered off. Then he also says, again, um, I love where it says on the in verse, end of verse 6, you cannot know her past. So right here when he says, you cannot know. You cannot know. It's interesting because in the word there that he uses is not yada, where he says they weren't, um, you know, they were, not, they were they're movable, not known, yada. Here he says, you cannot know, at the very end of verse 6, you cannot know her ways. And that word there is palas, which means you're not level. The word they use is level-headed. So you're not level-headed. That's why you can't respond. It means, you're not, it means you're not reasonable. You know, when your fellow friends will say to you, Preston, don't you see? And I'm like, no, man. Clearly, Mr. Magoo can see this is wrong. I'm like, no, I don't even see. Which you guys are just, come on, you just, don't you see? She's a sweetheart, and my wife's so mean. It's not the point. <laughs> it's not the point. You're married. That, that, that is clearly wrong. No, 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 it's not that bad. My son, my sons understand. No, they won't. No, they won't. Yeah, they're fine. You talk to them? No, you know, they're good. They'd be okay. <laughs> what? You can't. But that's what it is. You're 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 not level-headed. That's why you cannot know. They, they said Trump told his son didn't speak to him for a year when he divorced his first wife, Ivana. Oh, so yeah. Something. Which, by the way, this study of this passage leads you to understand something about Trump. I'm not trying to, this is not a lesson on him by no means. He's not the subject. But as a reference to a person who's been through this, I can tell you what this tells me is there's more underneath that relationship as father and son than they're leading to on the news. I don't care how much Junior or the other Trump, I forget his name, um, Donald and Eric want to act like they're these wonderful sons of their father. There's issues there. You cannot, you, you can, you, truth is truth. You can't avoid, you can't avoid this stuff. And unless he's been spiritually contrite and broken and made whole again, which is not the case, no offense, let's get real, he has an egometer off the chart. He's not gone, he's, he's, there's no way his sons and him are on this tight relationship. There's a mutual respect at best. There's a business decorum at best but there's not this loving um, understanding of father and son that you may think. It's not true. It can't happen. Not with, when you see this. It's what it is. And when it says level-headed, again, it means, again, you're not, you're not reasonable. But you can't be, um, you can't have any imperfections. Correct. So if any of your kids ever, you know, did something, they'd be out. No, I know. But you just... But yeah, I don't want to make him the subject, but just no. But so just think about this. Going back to the proverb here, forget Trump. He's just he's a subject of. So you get, you get so the proverb in verse six. So you, if you pondered her ways, you would know you can't know the end. And if you knew the end, then you you'd realize that you cannot know them. So you can't know because it's unknown to you, right? It's beforehand. You don't. She doesn't tell you about the form. Her paths are slippery. They make you wonder. And the reality is, you're not level-headed. So you can't see what you don't know. You can't, if you can't be reasoned with, then you're not going to understand. I remember before we got married, they said to me, hey, if there was 100 planes that took off, the same model airplane from the same airport during the same time of the year, and 99 crashed, would you send the 100th one off? And I said, so I'm a plane now? This is the exact thing they said to me. No joke. This is a psychologist, psychiatrist, whatever you want to call him, PhD guy at the church who said this to me. After invitations already went out and everything. Really hurtful. But the point being, he was basically trying to get me to understand that, that I was, he thought I was being palace. I wasn't being level-headed. He was trying to say, look, man, the, the odds on favored are you're going to fail, crash and burn, so we just kind of stop it before it starts. That's what he was saying. And, and I'm saying to him, 
It's your job to say that, which is fine, but it's my job after doing this for three months now. I got it. And we've had many conversations. We've talked for like 60 hours. This isn't news to me or news to you. So what is it that you don't, there's nothing scriptural that says don't do it. It's just your opinion. And at that point, I said, look, I'm not a plane. So I said to him, if your mother and father wanted you, dad to be a doctor, or mother to be a lawyer, whatever, and, and you, said, you said, no, you want to be a psychiatrist, does that mean you're disrespectful and devaluing your parents? No. It just means if you assented to, thank you, mom and dad, and you love me, and I choose to go this way, if you kindly and in respect and love said you assent to it, you acknowledge it, but then you chose your own path, isn't that God's will in your life, not so much a disrespect to your parents? And he goes, yeah, same here. I've acknowledged you guys have said uh, many, many times, but you've given me nothing scriptural to say it's not able to be done. You're just saying you wouldn't think it should be done. You think the odds are against you. That's fine. You think I'm pallas. I'm not level-headed. I'm not being reasonable. But the reality is I was being reasonable because I did acknowledge that it was a difficult situation. Now, to their point, though, I did not know after we got married how much difficulty it was going to be to have kids my age be stepkids and then be a grandfather. That's what they were basically were saying. Now, I, if they would have focused more on that part of it, I would have been more amenable to understanding their conversation, but they were judging me just on the basis of our age at the beginning, and that wasn't very nice. But the point being, on a good side of it, I saw how they looked at me as being not level-headed. And so because of my not being level-headed, I was in a nice way dogmatic about I'm getting married. But that same mentality for the good, people use for the evil. And they go, I'm, I'm being dogmatic. I'm not going to hear your, your rebuke which later on is why it says a person who's involved in this lifestyle, they don't hear reproof. They don't hear it, la, 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 because they're not level-headed. And I was in no mood to hear their so-called I wasn't level-headed speech because as far as I was concerned, I was. But one could paint me in that situation to say, well, I'm no different than this person, but on a good way. I was level-headed in a good way, but they thought I wasn't because I wasn't listening to reason. But I was listening to reason within the Bible. They weren't showing me biblical reason. They were showing me their own man-made reason. I wanted to see a biblical reason. They didn't give me one. But when you give a person a biblical reason and they reject you, then they're being, they're being, they're, they're not being pallas. They can't, they're being pallas, excuse me. They're not level-headed. They can't possibly reason the truth of what you're showing them in the Bible. Don't you realize there's a judgment ahead for you? There's Gehenna, there's Hades, we know this stuff. And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. You don't understand. You're not, it's not funny, right? So verse 7. Verse 7, he says, Now, therefore, my son, hearken. This, the word there is shema. Is the, you get the, he, the, Jew, the Deuteronomy 6 4, the shema, right? It means comprehend, listen closely. To me, and slight not my words. Verse 7, hear now, therefore, O sons, and depart not aside from the words of my mouth. So, verse 7, he says, the shema, where the word is hearken. Listen attentively. And he said, again, do not slight. Do not, what's he say in the King James? Do not turn aside is the best way. Do not slight, which is the right Hebrew word, the word there he says there. Do not sewer, do not turn aside. or deviate, if you will. From the word. And the word there, of course, is the word of God. That's what he's talking about, right? So the reality is, again, it goes back to, he, he tells you how, how to prevent it, tells you what's going to happen if you don't, and it ends with, so far in this first coupling of verses, saying, son, if you just would listen and not deviate from the word of God, then you won't be a deviant, right? Because a deviant is one who deviates, right? The reason why you're a deviant sexually is because you've deviated from what God said is the way to do this, right? There's a right and a wrong way. Verse 8, remove thy way far from her and come not nigh the door of her house. Ye, right? So it says remove from her. This is where you got the Joseph thing, by the way. Now we got the Joseph thing. When he says remove, you'll have this. The word for remove here is the word rakach, R-A-C-H-A-Q. And it means very distant, <laughs> which is what Joseph did. He fled. 
You know, it goes back to the old story where I, 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 there's a guy named Dwight Bain. God love him. He's a, he's a counselor in Orlando, counsels married couples. And the lady was a victim of her husband stepping out and doing adultery years and years and years and years ago, maybe 30 years ago. And the story goes where, um, he, I was on a radio program, he told the story, where the woman said, um, I'm the victim. So he evoked, if you will, the biblical thing of, I don't want this to end. Oh, great, she was thinking, that sucks. Because Dwight Bain said, well, under biblical principle, even though he made you the victim, he doesn't want it, he doesn't want it to end. He wants to work it out. That means you've got to stay. She's like, well, that sucks. I don't, I, don't, I don't feel really, I feel violated right now. I, feel, I don't feel like I want him. I don't want to have him to stay. Well, biblically speaking, if you want to pursue the ways of God, then you have to. Oh, man. She's like, that's, okay. But she, he goes, well, wait a minute. There's good news for you. He's like, he was like going, yeah, I got the upper hand here. He's like, not so fast. Because you made her the victim, she stays under her terms. You name the terms. And that means, he goes, he, the guy says, what does that mean? He goes, that means you shut up and let her dictate how she wants you to fight and stay in this marriage. What does that mean? Well, let's find out. Um, miss, what would you like? She says, quit your job, leave the state, go to Oregon, because they were here, and never talk to her again by phone, email, text, letter, no way, zero, nothing. He goes, that's, that's, that, I'm the VP of the firm. I don't care. <laughs> you quit today, we move to Oregon, and you never talk to her again. Uh, 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 okay. So he did it. They went on to reconcile their marriage. They went on to then teach marriage retreat to people that said, hey, we're on the mountaintop in the valley back on the mountaintop again. And they would teach people to understand how they'd been in those places of happiness, brokenness, back to restoration. Great story. But the point is that now, the, he, she wanted to let him know, you got to be very, you got to remove yourself from her, very distant, literally. I mean, Florida, Oregon is pretty far, <laughs> right? But he, she, she wanted no possible chance that on a, some whimsical night he could swing by her house or she could swing by and meet her somewhere. No, you can't. Not if you're in Oregon and you're in Florida. The only way to get there quickly is by plane. I, I, know, I know when that's happening. <laughs> so, so, you know, and then there's no phone call, there's no texting, there's no... Well, that back then there wasn't texting, but there's no phone calls, no letters, there's no email, none of that stuff. It's pretty awesome. That's that's what she meant by very keeping yourself very distant. So, and Proverbs eight, he says, remove yourself from her, very distant, like Joseph did to Potiphar's wife. She grabbed at him. He didn't start to reason with her. He said, oh, I know what you want. You're a sexual deviant. Have my coat, and there you go, and I'm gone. <laughs> he took off. Use it for what you want to tell any lie you want. I don't care. I'm not going to be here to to reason with you when you're being a sexual deviant. He got as far from her as he possibly could. So he says, and go not near her doors. And that means don't approach the doors of her house, right? So remove very distant from her. And what's that? Oh, she's mean. And then finally, you know, but Joseph never bothered. He knew. And he ran. That's what the best man told him about that story. He ran. He, he fled. And he suffered the consequence of going into uh, prison. But it was safer to do that than to, um, because he had charge of that whole house. You know, everything that Potiphar had, he put it into Joseph's hands. And that's kind of what, well, kind of, that's what you're saying now. And by the way, Look at this next part of verse 8. There's so much in these verses. I'm sorry if I'm taking so long. People go, oh, my God, I'm only really going to finish this chapter. I'm sorry. This is how the Lord lead me to do this because you have to understand this. this is a very important issue because men always say, I can read the chapter, but I don't get it what you get from it. I don't get what you get from it. I don't get what you get. Okay, okay, I'm trying to help you understand that, okay? So, so here you see, remove yourself. What does that mean exactly? Stay away from her. Make it so impossible geographically telecommunication-wise, technology-wise, make it very ridiculously, hinderingly impossible for you and her to have contact, okay? Don't be, you know what it means. Stop trying to justify their idiocy here. You know what it means. Then secondly, he says, and do not go near a karab. Don't approach the doors of her house. What does that mean? That means stop with the ridiculousness of going, oh, look, she sent me a card for our, for our anniversary, honey. Burn it! Tear it up! I want to save her address. For what reason? Do it! Shred it. Don't even think about it. Get real. Don't go toward her door. Don't even entertain the idea. We can be friends one day. No! No, you can't. No, you can't. No, you can't. 
Stop it. Stop your lies and deceiving yourself. Well, one day we can actually be friends. No, you cannot. You're insane. No, you can't. No, you can't. No, you can't. Yes. Um, Vicki said, remove and far are the same Hebrew word. R-A-C-H-A-Q. Yep. Remove it far. It's correct. And so he says here, he says here, um, do not, again, go near. Again, that means stop trying to justify once you're far away that you can still keep in contact in some way or you can be friends or you could, no, no. It's like she's dead to you, okay? And like you're dead to her, all right? So go ahead to the funeral and the obituary papers if you want to. She's gone. Do not try to justify. Well, she was always nice to the kids. I don't care. Well, she's sending a college tuition for so-and-so. I don't send it back. Don't take it. Take zero nice gestures from her. Zero. Invite nothing. Accept nothing. Reject everything. Okay? Remove. Very distant. Do not approach toward her. Give it zero. Be at peace. No doubt. Be at peace. But reject any aspect of her wanting to be in your life in any capacity at all. Don't be foolish and think, oh, come on, that's being mean. Is it? Because it turns out that she's the one beforehand who did all of this. Who's the one who's mean? Who's the one who's mean? Who's the one that said, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurt you where I'm going to take from your spiritual blessing God gave you? That's not mean. You can't get any more harmful than that when you're trying to take from God what he's given to you. That is offensive to God. Stop justifying how mean you're being to her when you had to realize that she, whether she wanted to or not, I'm not trying to play her, put her in some evil de depiction, but she herself was used by Satan or demonic presences or whatever or both. She was used to, again, take from you spiritually a blessing that God had given you. How dare her? And she's taking from you not just what you had, but with your wife and your kids and all your prodigy after her and before her are affected by this. How dare her? want to say afterwards, we can be friends. We can still talk. No, you cannot. Ever. Ever. Don't even, don't even look at a picture of her. Ever. Never. Burn every picture. Shred it. <laughs> Done with it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not excusing or condoning the men that are in this situation, but there are some men out there, enough men out there, that don't have a my son, that don't have a wife, father, counseling them. I know. I know. And, and they... Well, you, you said yourself. I, I, here's the thing. I have a, I have a grandson who we met with last Wednesday. Truth, last Wednesday meeting at Perkins, we do once a month uh, conversations about spiritual and life and stuff. And, and he said he's scared about getting married. And I thought he meant just, you know, 26 years old, you know, weak at the knees, big responsibility, that kind of thing. No, he didn't mean that. He meant that, but a whole lot more. I go, well, well what do you mean? Well, look, Nana and Grandpa were divorced, and you're married. Mom's been divorced. My two uncles are divorced. Ooh. He goes, it's in my blood. I'm like, oh, God. What he's saying is right. He's not lying, right? And he has nobody, no offense, he has nobody who's encouraging him to understand, right? So I had to nicely tip, tip, I had to tip, I had to tip to on the tulips there. I didn't want to offend and disrespect his parents, but I also didn't want to offend Nana because, yeah, she's been divorced. I said, but he said how that works, by the way, Ryan. I said, Here, here's the scary part about divorce. If you look at it from a biblical standpoint, I just, I'm not going to, I can do a whole lesson on this, but to make it real simple, anybody who's been through a divorce, and if I offend you right now, it's, it's not my intention, nor is it my fault. Blame God. Shake your fist at him. I didn't write the book. But if someone's been divorced, then by default, one of those people is allowed to never remarry unless one other person, the other person dies. And they can't kill them, by the way. That's why I told Ryan. And he laughed. And I go, so you can't kill them. So when there's two people together. Boom, there's divorce. Only one can remarry until the other one's dead. Then they both, then the other one surviving can remarry. So when they're both alive, only one can remarry. And he goes, what? So think about people in this world that have been divorced and remarried. Did they follow that rule? And they're probably, they're, probably, they're going, what's the big deal? My life's fine. Okay. You, you go ahead and keep thinking that. Keep fooling yourself. Because you're breaking the rules. And sooner or later, you're going to face the lawmaker. Let's see what he says about it. It's not funny. I'm telling you, man, it's not funny. I said, so, with that being said, to your point, so you're saying it's part of your blood, it's in your veins, it's a part of your history. I had no one to help you. I said, here's what you want to do. Your spiritual man inside you and your soul fight with each other constantly over what the body, eyes, mind, soul, ears, hands, feet, what you do, what you think, what you are engaged in. So your soul and spirit fight. 
you're physically, he's ripped by the way, real physically ripped. I said, Ron, you're physically ripped. So when you're physically ripped, like physically a specimen of like chiseled, you know, going to the fitness center all the time, do that same commitment and, and physique to your spiritual man. Then your spiritual man will dominate your solical man and your soul or your blood that defines your DNA code. It's like the whole aspect of your nutritional because he's studying to be nutrition as well as doing training people. I said, so you know as well as I know, your DNA is your gun of predisposition toward diabetes, toward cholesterol, but your diet is the trigger, right? So I could be predisposed to diabetes. Doesn't, doesn't mean that I'm gonna be diabetic. Oh, no, it doesn't. It just means that I have to be more careful about having sugar intake, right? I'm reported, my, my literal one, by the way, is cholesterol. That's my literal one. Nancy's is literally diabetes. So she has to be more lean, more careful of carbs and sugars. I have to be more careful of cholesterol foods, bacon, pork, right? So, and shellfish. So even though I love all that stuff. So the reality is I have to be careful of that. By the way, two weeks ago, I got my best health reading ever. If you're with me for a while, I guess. My best health reading ever in 20 years, my doctor said. And all my levels came down by 50 points. So I'm eating fiber every morning now, right? And flax and all that stuff. So the point being, I said, Ryan, your spiritual man, build him up so he's so strong that your DNA solical man, the, the gun, is not being triggered because the spiritual man is now triggering a new part of you that no one's done before on the male side of your DNA. And now you're living as a male under the guidance of the spirit of God's will, not the soul of your blood's predisposition. And he goes, wow. I said, that's how you don't live in fear. That's how you live in success. And that's how you have a marriage based on the Lord. That's what I told him. And he, he goes, I, that's helpful. I said, good, it's supposed to be. That's, what, that's the answer to the question. But to your point, how many young men have someone in their life saying that to them? Probably not many, I don't know. But it's pretty sad that they don't, right? This is sad. Now, I'm, I'm the only person in my whole family. There's eight boys and five girls. One of my brothers is dead or missing or whatever. He's not alive as far as I know. But the other, all of us, girls and boys alike, only me, married into a Christian 